Welcome to this week's Armchair Trader podcast and we're taking a bit of a step back today, uh, looking, taking a bit of a broader view of what's going on in the wider markets and also specifically talking a little bit more about fund management and fund selection. And joining us today on the podcast, we're uh, very lucky to have Tom Caddick, who is the CIO of Ned Group Investments International, who will be discussing some of these themes with us today. So welcome to the podcast, Tom. Many thanks, Joe. Good to be here. Um, so, I mean, by by way of my own personal background, I, in, in a previous life, many years ago, I used to work for a, a fund of funds and um, quite familiar with with the challenges of picking the right the right fund managers for your portfolio. As we record this podcast, it's obviously quite a it's a time of trial for many investors. Um, some of the data coming out from wealth managers indicate that a lot of them are. Uh, worried about the state of the market um, and seeing things in the market that many of them may may not remember seeing previously. When we're looking at investing more generally, a lot of people start off investing in, say, equity markets. Um, but if someone is going to be taking a much sort of longer view in terms of uh, increasing their wealth or protecting their wealth, should they be looking at a wider wider spectrum of funds and asset classes yeah i think and that's a really good kickoff point actually because what we've seen in markets over the last decade plus is a high degree of commonality between those sort of two more traditional asset classes of of equities and and bonds so as you know as you will remember, it's what we talk about is the correlation between asset classes. And that's sort of the magic thing that we look for when building diversification. And the reason for building diversification into the way in which you invest into your portfolio is to help you steer and navigate through different different market conditions and to have different elements to your portfolio that are there to bring something different to your portfolio, be it protecting against inflation, be it to help cushion some of the volatility that you may get. But we've seen a high degree of correlation between equities and bonds over the last decade or so, which has basically meant that when equities have done well, quite often bonds have been doing well at the same time. And what we've seen in this recent sell-off, and this has been a challenging year to date for any investor, has been a sell-off in equity markets and a sell-off in bond markets. So you really haven't had the protection that you would have wanted from a more traditionally more defensive asset such as bonds. So yes, I would argue that you should be looking at true multi-asset, looking across the range of investable opportunities that are out there. And and traditionally, I mean, I'm thinking back now, I'm thinking back to the 1990s here. Um, A lot of investors were very equity orientated. There was an equity bull market then. And if they were looking at diversification, it used to be, say, into bonds, maybe into some sort of listed real estate investment trusts, things like that. Do you think that that's still something that works now? Or, or do you think that really they should be looking at a little bit more wider in terms of asset classes? I, I would say look wider. I do think that you know some of those those core principles of investment hold true and that an area such as equities, which is a hugely liquid market, particularly when you're looking at the larger cap and looking global, hugely liquid market that is well researched and can provide you with some of those sort of fundamental elements of, of, of investment hold true and would, are likely to make up a large proportion of one's exposure, much like with the bond market as well. But Actually, some of those links, those traditional links, and you, you talk back to the late 90s, and I, I completely agree, those would have been the, the fundamental cornerstones of, of an investment. Um, but no, I think you should look wider. Um, I think that uh, certain areas such as um, infrastructure investment, all which are now accessible via um, liquid, um, investable securities, um, areas such as commodities, infrastructure absolutely you you touched on commercial property um, there but actually it's a much broader remit now so areas such as investing in care homes for example will behave very differently to um, a retail 
unit um, in the West End. So you do get very different uh, investment profiles from a number of these different areas, all the way through to alternative types of investments. So strategies that can maybe benefit from volatility in the markets or even down to areas such as music rights, which are now packaged up as, as, as investable opportunities. So really the, the menu of funds, what you're saying is that the menu of different funds and strategies and specialist managers available is um, much, much broader than it was even, say, 10, 15 years ago. And that, that even a, a retail investor has a lot more they can choose from than, than they would have had at the start of this century. So uh, yes, a large institutional investor like a pension fund or a family office would already be familiar with infrastructure investments. But what's happened now is that fund managers and product providers have created those same opportunities at a, at a price point, at a ticket size that that a retail investor can actually get access to as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's talk a bit about real assets. And by real assets, what we're really talking about here is, is um, property infrastructure, basically funds that buy something real so that there's an actual tangible thing you can touch we're not talking about a a fund that's got you know futures in it or anything like that what do you think that they can play a a bigger role in investment portfolios at the moment yes in in short i do and and like you say by real assets we are talking about more sort of physical underlying that are linked to a physical underlying let's not get too technical and argue that actually an equity is also a real asset that we're not talking about that we're talking about things like commodities um be it specific or general um uh, property infrastructure things like renewable energy um where there's a there is a physical um wind farm or whatever it may be um Yes, I think so. And I think that for a number of different reasons, partly because they can give you access to a stable, long term income stream, degree of security from that income stream, quite often in things like infrastructure projects. We're not talking about early stage infrastructure. That's not where I'm particularly interested in. I'm thinking of more linked to long term government or council or um, highly securitized long-term contracts, which will have a linkage to inflation, uh, typically upward only shift, where there is a link to either RPI or CPI to that, um, to the income payment. And they give you a long visibility, long-term visibility of your income stream. And that's an extremely attractive thing, particularly in this sort of environment. Areas such as commodities obviously has been a hot topic recently, but things like energy prices have, have, have soared. Um, having invested in an area such as renewable energy and specifically things like wind, um, which in the UK is a resource that is fairly, uh, fairly highly available. The UK is a windy place, but those have generated really strong returns um, over the past year or so. And that is partly because Regardless of the spike that we've seen in in energy prices, they do give you a long-term, relatively visible income stream that's fairly attractive. But also, you have that linkage to the electricity price. The electricity price is linked to gas prices. Gas prices have soared, and these have been able to benefit from that shift upwards in, in prices. Now, it's not about one should have foreseen that, really. It's about having exposure to multiple risks or multiple opportunities within a portfolio that can benefit at different times in the market. So those are the sorts of areas that have done really well. But real assets generally tend to have a natural degree of a linkage to inflation, which in this sort of environment is extremely attractive. And these, these sorts of funds, these kinds of strategies, they're something that people already have indirect exposure to via their their pension fund, for example, because pension fund managers have traditionally been putting some of their money into this kind of this kind of strategy, this kind of real asset approach. But the the, the I guess the big difference now is that more of that kind of fund is available as well um, in a, either a listed version like 
you know, via an investment trust or a REIT, or there are other managed funds on the market as well that are that are more accessible and that you know people can look at. It totally, it's absolutely that. Do you think that people have got a little bit lazy these days because they've spent had such a long period of time with very very low inflation, low interest rates? I wouldn't say benign equity markets, but but certainly nothing like we've seen since say twenty twenty, um, and and the idea of having to you know invest with a view to beating something like higher inflation or beating something like higher you know, intrinsic market volatility that wasn't something people had to consider with their portfolios they could have got along with a nice little you know equity bond balance is that something that's still going to work now i think that that's one of the key questions that people have have got to try to answer i my take and, and our approach to this is that you've You've, well, you've needed diversification for some time. Um, obviously, it depends on what one's target is, but you've had this sort of synchronization of those two core asset classes for a period of time. This long bull run where you've had yields falling low and then lower and then lower still, and lower yields means higher price, clearly in fixed income. You've got that inverse relationship. And at the same time, you've had this long bull run in equity markets, where, put simply, really all you needed to do was make sure you got the right amount of exposure, have good exposure to equities and a sprinkling of bonds, and you would have done very well. It's not about outperforming each other, but you just would have done well in terms of investment objectives. I do think that we're now mo- moving into a different scenario. Um, I would have argued that you would have you needed diversification within your portfolio for some time, but. Having inflation protection built into your portfolio sort of five years ago, people would have been asking and questioning that because you would have had inflation at at those sort of manageable levels of sort of two, two and a half percent, which is the target of most central banks. Um, and you've got equity markets on this bull run because partly interest rates were so low, cost of capital was was cheap. A lot of the growth companies were able to fund their growth through cheap capital coming through. So it really was a sort of self-fulfilling momentum that was behind the market. And that we are entering into a different phase for sure. But I would argue at all times for diversification within your portfolio. But I think now more than ever, that case is, is true. I do think you're right, Stuart, because I think people tend to invest it's that sort of natural inverse relationship of of risk and return um and you know once you buy low sell high but actually people tend to to buy high sell low unfortunately because of that sort of those impulses against wanting some sort of verification from the market so all the time markets are rallying people are getting more and more involved in in equity markets then when they sell off people tend to panic and clearly that's the inverse of what one should do as an investor, it's to look through the noise and invest for the long term. But it's never quite as simple as that. I'll put you slightly on the spot here and just ask you, if someone's someone's worried about inflation, which a lot of people are, and they're looking at maybe, as you say, as we've been talking about on the podcast, diversifying their portfolio further, maybe looking at real asset strategies. Traditionally, people always used to say, well, just make an allocation to gold. Gold's a real you know, protector against inflation. And gold price has really done very little um, in the last uh, couple of years, really. Um, where, where, should, where should people be looking in terms of real asset strategies as, a, as an inflation protector? Yeah. I do quite like gold now. I think that that's, you know, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. If you were a sterling investor investing in gold, you would look okay because dollars done, you know, just astonishingly strong. But clearly as a straight asset class, it really hasn't responded to, to this recent market weakness. It's really been the dollar that's, that's, that's rallying. But I do think that as a long-term potential store of, of wealth and providing some protection to a potentially sort of recessionary environment, or indeed stagflationary, where you have falling growth or sort of um, negative growth at, at an economic level, and yet still high inflation. It could be attractive. 
Um, certainly is a small portion within your portfolio. But broadly speaking, within real assets, I do think infrastructure looks interesting. I do still believe that commercial property, um, but going into managed commercial property, i.e. rather than just passively trying to accept, uh, um, say, a global REIT, for example, but going into a managed global REIT or more physical bricks and mortar could be quite an attractive area. But making sure that you're investing into areas that are sort of less cyclical, um, so rather than necessarily high exposure to sort of high street uh, shops, that kind of area, which can be far more cyclical in their nature. But I do think that that can give quite attractive returns. We continue to like areas such as renewable energy. There's a lot priced in now, but still that's sort of, we're looking at moving into a different environment now where actually we might end up with long-term, very visible contracts uh, at the ele- for renewable electricity prices, as well as the potential for a cut in VAT here in the UK. Um, all of those should play pretty well to areas such as renewable energy. We're obviously, again, we see a lot of, a lot of data coming out at the moment about investor confidence and how it's been plunging and, and how everyone's feeling really negative about the market. Do you think from where you're sitting, is this is this being caused more by the, the conflict in Ukraine since February or, or is it more the inflation? Because we saw the reaction recently when the market sold off on the back of a very incremental rise in US inflation. Is it, the, is it inflation that's really driving this this uh, bearish outlook or is it is it the, the uncertainty around what's happening in the Ukraine conflict? I think... I think that they are linked and there is a cause and effect here. But I do believe it's in it's inflation. That's what people feel. That's the you know, that's the far more tangible element of getting, you know, soaring energy prices, less to spend when you're or less goods when you're spending money in the supermarket. Those are the things that affect people. It can be far more existential looking at a a conflict on the news. And it is horrific. It is terrible. You see these images on the news, but fundamentally that is what you're seeing. It is something that is far off. And I think in terms of impacting very directly sentiment, it tends to be what you feel personally and what you're experiencing. Now, I say that they're interlinked because they absolutely are. The... Uh, Russian invasion of of Ukraine has had a very, very direct impact on particularly within Europe, but also the world generally, a very direct impact on commodity prices, uh, specifically the impact on the price of food, which is feeding through very directly into the inflationary impact that the man on the street, um, you and I, are feeling um, when we we go shopping, the availability. Um, as well as the impact on energy prices. So clearly what we are seeing is that direct impact, particularly within Europe and particularly west parts of Western Europe and other parts of Eastern Europe, where we're seeing energy prices soar on the back of the natural gas price, which has uh, in- increased its volatility, shot up in value, in-, in price. That has a knock-on effect of the linkage that we see with electricity prices. So again, we're seeing that as a knock-on effect of, of that but a long answer to a short question i do think it is directly it's inflation that that is that is knocking sentiment i want to ask you about commercial property we have mentioned real assets already you've talked a little bit about it but it is it does seem to me to be one of the real hot spots in the market at the moment um i'm not talking just about the uk either but they're despite what el- what else is going on with the economy and what else is going on with the market, um, some of these commercial real estate fund managers still seem to be able to knock out some very respectable numbers as well. What, what's driving that? Why is that particular sector seems to have detached itself from, from the rest of reality? Yeah, I think the answer to that is partly technical. So you've got a couple of different ways of investing in in commercial property outside of just literally going out if you have the funds and buying a shop or or buying an industrial unit um, and then leasing it out. So one is to buy uh, REITs, which are then traded on the secondary market, i.e. as an equity. And they do have a much closer relationship with the broader equity market. 
So you will see much greater volatility as you would with equity markets. There is then the opportunity to buy, let's say, uh, certainly in the UK um, and Europe, an investment trust with physical property underlying where, yes, the price will vary because it's, it's an investment trust and it trades on the market. But fundamentally, the underlying will value periodically. And in some cases, they might value those assets monthly. It could be quarterly, uh, but it could be more periodic. So you tend to see this sort of almost technically a more natural lower volatility, so lower price movement, par- partly because it's not priced daily or, or even by the minute. It's, it, it prices to a valuation uh, cycle. So you do get that sort of lag effect. Um, I think it's also partly, again, because of that pricing mechanism, the pricing will be based on uh, such things as tenant quality. It will be done on tenancy generally, so tenant levels, uh, income stream, etc. All of those would be based into the price, which is a far more slow moving mechanism than necessarily either sentiment or um, other people's valuation models. So you do get that. Having said all of that, I think it would be fair to say you've got a you've got part of a market which really suffered in the pandemic. You saw tenancy levels drop off as we saw default rates go uh, climb. You saw um, uh, landlords and particularly some of these uh, trusts having to uh, give uh, rental holidays to their underlying tenants to just try to move through. And in some cases, you saw them move to a very wide discount. Um, and that's the sort of the pricing mechanism that you get in the market. And what we've had as we've come out of that pandemic is an improvement in the fundamentals. So you've seen tenant strength re, um, uh, improve significantly. You've seen rental rates climbing. Um, the demand for those has risen. And at the same time, you've had this big discount start to close. So they've looked really attractive. And it's certainly been in, in an area that we've been keen to maintain within the portfolios because they have done really well. And that's partly just really the fundamentals of that sort of economic linkage to a a market that's just starting to reopen again. People are starting to get back out into the shops. Industrial units have really started to pick up again. Um, And it's more been a supply rather than demand-led shock that's driven things like the inflationary numbers that we're seeing at the moment. So a number of those tenants are still relatively high quality, relatively secure. So you've got a number of factors at play that has given that sort of almost breakage from the link. You've also got rentals that are quite often linked to inflation. So a number of the exposures that we've got, there is a collar that's applied to the way in which the uh, uh, rent is, is adjusted. So that would be a minimum and a maximum, but linked directly to inflation. So you've had that inflationary sort of pulse effect that's come through as well. And just finally, I wanted to ask you um, a question about emerging markets and frontier markets. And this really goes back to the way investors used to look at funds. And there were obviously, and there still are specialist emerging markets funds. But back in, again, going back to the 90s, there used to be various emerging markets specialist managers who you could make an allocation to because they were a specialist manager in that area. And that that was your emerging markets allocation. Um, Since then, we've seen this split between emerging markets and frontier markets, with frontier markets being the much more high risk, more illiquid markets. Um, But also, you're seeing now a lot of thematic, as as the planet becomes more globalized, you're seeing more thematic managers um, coming on who are running a strategy that, it's a thematic strategy, but has a lot of emerging markets exposure within it because this is where some of the real high growth is is being realized at the moment from these very fast developing countries. Is it still valid today if you're if you're running a, a sort of multi fund portfolio? Is it still valid today to really think about emerging markets in those terms as a specific allocation to an emerging market fund or? Or are emerging markets now, those opportunities are almost being taken into other funds in other ways and are are existing in those funds and in those thematic strategies so that really 
from an investor perspective, you're you're starting to think, well, I don't really need my emerging market strategy specifically. I'd rather get that exposure, say, through my real estate strategy or say through my infrastructure strategy or through my, you know, high growth digital economies thematic ETF. I mean, is 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 thinking about emerging markets as part of your portfolio still a valid calculation for investors? So uh, in short, I would say yes. Um, and, and actually currently probably now more than ever, you need a specialist in this space f- for sure. Emerging markets do still behave in different ways. Um, like you say, you've got the more frontier markets, but in that broader global emerging market space, they do behave slightly differently to the uh, more developed areas. Um, you do, they do exhibit higher levels of risk. And you do look for you do need and look for a specialist to navigate that. Um, having said that, you mentioned the point about globalization and the global linkage between different areas, and that is absolutely true. So you could play and you will get exposure to a number of different themes that may play out in emerging market equities or otherwise, or within a global fund that is giving you specific exposure to one particular theme or strategy. So there are multiple ways that you can access those areas. But in terms of the pure performance and behavior of those markets, I would put it that they do still behave in a certain way. They do exhibit a particular level of risk. And we think of our investment approach as the risk budget and how we want to spend that risk budget and how we want to allocate within the portfolio. And there are times when emerging markets can exhibit very, very elevated levels of risk and volatility, um, that they can dislocate themselves from other parts of the more developed markets. So having a specialist vital, um, I would still suggest that you, you would have an allocation specific to emerging market as opposed to just a thematic approach. But we do think that thematic and the more traditional approach shouldn't be seen as mutually exclusive. It can give you exposure to some really powerful themes by taking a more thematic approach, or at least within your portfolio, allowing yourself exposure to some of those more sort of longer term thematics uh, within your portfolio. I wouldn't necessarily warrant purely taking that approach because that can lead to some really powerful, positive and negative variations in your performance. And so just to end with um, looking forward to the next 12 months, which which particular market do you do you feel most bullish on? Which do you favour? Oh, interestingly, I do think emerging markets will start to really perform well um, as we start to come out of this uh, cycle. There are certain things that we do know. We do know inflation will come under control. It will start to fall. What we don't know is exactly when, and there are a number of factors at play here. Um, There's no point in going through all of them, but some of them are are created and some of them will be market forces uh, that drive that. But we know it will come under control. The question is, do we need to go through a recessionary cycle um, before we get there? And that's what central banks are grappling with at the moment. And they're walking a fairly fine line uh, between inflationary control and stifling growth. So there are a number of other areas we know that central banks will start to moderate. Uh, We just don't know where that landing phase will be. And that will be mostly driven by things like inflation um, and how that uh, that looks. But I do think that emerging markets are a number of different areas. I mean, even areas such as such as China, and parts of the Far East, which have really suffered over the last couple of years, um, will start to look really interesting again. So I would put forward emerging markets. I continue to believe that uh, real assets are a really important part of portfolios to give you some protection. Um, I think that certain alternative strategies are a really important part um, to add to your portfolios. Equities generally, if one can take a sufficiently long-term view, and that's obviously wrapped in so many caveats, it's untrue, that they do start to look really interesting. I mean, one of the 
upshots of a falling market is that valuations start to look more attractive again. Um, so taking a long-term lens, both historic and forward-looking, equities start to look pretty fair value uh, at these sorts of levels. Now, that's not to say that there's not more, more bad news in the near term, but taking that sort of 12-plus month view, I think equities do look interesting and risk generally within your portfolio looks interesting. But uh, equities generally, I think emerging markets will come come through and then having those diversifiers in your portfolio uh, will be very important. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Great to have someone someone on the podcast who can who can show us some light at the end of the tunnel. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. You've been listening to the Armchair Trader podcast. Make sure you visit our website, www.thearmchairtrader.com for your daily dose of financial markets news and sign up to our free newsletter there.